session that we're having here and later we're going to go downstairs for the closing remarks and the closing ceremony and so right here we have Mark Jones and Pam Shastak is that how I pronounce it and so there will be there was going to be a discussion and it's is it time for a, a strategic GPL litigation plan so please uh, hello, everyone. I hope this mic works as well. Um, so in this slide, we have built in time for discussion. So please be prepared to share your thoughts. I know that's usually hard to ask an audience to do at a free software conference. Um, and I apparently have to keep this closer to me. Um, so um, introduction. So uh, what I wanted, what we wanted to talk about was proposing the idea of do we need to think about a strategic litigation plan or the kind of litigation that would be appropriate for the community? Um, because I think things have changed since you know, 15 years ago when the community decided to largely kind of shun that. So I wanted to raise the question, is it time to do that? Um, and are there anything that, anything about that, how we'd want it to look? Um, or maybe even like what the community is. Um, so today I'm not advocating that we actually do do it. I'm advocating that we ask the question. I'm not trying to craft a strategy here now, but just gather thoughts about what that might look like if we were to do it. Um, and, to, and as a community enforcement, right? So not from the proprietary interests, like I think that's already happening, they have their own, but as a community, do we want to have that happen? So what we're going to do, um, the, the format of today is uh, we have about, uh, well, it says a dozen cases, maybe not quite so many cases to talk about. What's going to happen is we will give sort of a short introduction, background on what it is, what the case is, what the facts were, what it is we think is, is the takeaway from it that we wanted to talk about. And then we're going to open the floor for discussion for about seven minutes to kind of get, and, and what we're looking for not is, it's not a question and answer. It's what we're looking for is a discussion amongst amongst the audience um, to just flesh out these these concepts. Um, and we hope for vigorous disagreement on uh, the on the points here um, because that's that's kind of the whole point of it is t is to find out what's going on. So um, so during the discussion, what we want you to be thinking about and answering are. Does this case freak me out? Was there something that happened here that really fundamentally disturbs me? Um, and what about, what about this case surprises me? Uh, what did I not expect? If, why, in some cases, why have we not been talking about these cases? Some of them you'll see, they're probably not on your radar at all. Uh, conceding this is also from a US perspective, so it may not be even as much on a European radar. And, and, is, and, and sort of the, you know, is there strategic litigation that we should be doing to step in to this situation? So with that said, and also you aren't going to be able to see probably, but at the bottom of each slide we've tried to add uh, a time so we can kind of see how we're doing on time so that we don't, so that we stay on, on, um, stay on schedule for the discussion. So on to the cases. Just a quick question before you get started. Is it fair for us to talk about any possible litigation that might, for example, in particular, might go beyond the principles of copyleft enforcement? And maybe would there be, could we entertain, for example, statutory damages? Um, that's kind of off, it, it plays into a little bit of what we're, of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I don't, asking for damages is not outside, asking for damages is not outside of the community principles. Okay. The principles do allow for, for a financial okay. recovery. Um, and I just want to iterate what Pam said. Both Pam and I are both U.S. attorneys, um, so all of the cases we've selected here are underneath U.S. copyright law. Um, I know there are significant differences between U.S. copyright law and European law. Um, we welcome comments from those who are familiar with copyright law in other jurisdictions, and we also welcome comments from um, developers in the community who care about how these licenses are being interpreted um, and what the outcomes they look for, too. So please don't hold back, um, and we apologize for it being so U.S.-centric, but that's where we're from. <laughs> um, so um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this case, but this is J Jacobson versus Katzer. This was a really big case for U.S. attorneys. Um, before this case came out, it was an open question amongst U.S. attorneys as to whether or not free and open source software licenses were even enforceable. 
Um, so when this case came out, the court made it very clear that you can enforce uh, free and open source software licenses in U.S. courts, right? And that really kind of changed the conversation that lawyers were having because instead of worrying about could you enforce these, uh, it shifted the conversation to um, what does compliance look like and what kind of licenses should we be using and, and what properties do they have? Um, and that really gets into what we want to talk about today, is there's lots of other cases that are actually going on right now. So the first case, or the first series of cases I want to talk about, um, is what I call the Philpot cases. Um, I, I looked, and there have been 34 cases filed since January of 2018. I did not go back further than that intentionally. This is all that came to my SERP results. Um, but there is a photographer in the United States who uh, regularly contributes photos of rock musicians to Wikipedia. Um, and in the last year or so, he has sued 38 uh, media outlets for violating the Creative Commons by license. The, not, not the CC by SA, the Creative CC by license in the United States. Some of those have settled. Some of them are still actively open. Um, the causes of action, the, thing, the reasons why he is suing, um, have been consistent across all of those cases. Um, if you look at the pleadings, um, they're pretty much cut and paste with some substitutions. Um, he's suing for copyright infringement and for copyright management information, um, which copyright management information would be the lack of it, right? So the copyright notices aren't being included, which in the United States is also a violation of copyright law. Um, like I said before, most of these photos are photos that were contributed to Wikipedia of musicians. Um, and for those who are inclined to fact check, um, I did provide citations because, you know, it's Wikipedia. You got any citations included. Um, so here's four of them. Um, there are 34 or the 30 other of them if anyone's really curious to read all of them. Um, I'll send them to you and then you can send me back uh, summaries of all of them because I, I stopped reading after a while. Um, so the point, why am I bringing this up? So this is a related license to free software license, right? This is a Creative Commons license. Um, I usually think of myself as like a free culture attorney because I get questions about free software licenses. I get questions about open data licenses. I get questions on the Creative Commons licenses. I don't actually think this is very different. Um, but as a community, we tend to think that there's not a lot of litigation going on, um, that there's no litigation on permissive licenses. But in the last year, there are 34 cases out there on a permissive license um, that I scope inside of my field of practice. Um, so should we care about this as a community? I'm Federico Leva from, Vic from Wikimedia Italia, and I think this is great because uh, we actually have as Wikimedia Commons the repository, the Wikimedia repository for photos. We have a common problem that photographers come to us and say, well, I don't want to put photos in CC BY on, y on your, or even CC BY SA on your website, because then in practice, nobody is going to respect my right. And the, uh, what, and I have no real answer to that, because the Wikimedia Foundation cannot sue anybody who uh, violates the license on behalf of mm -hmm. the contributors. And most photographers don't care, don't have the resources to do it. So it's very helpful to be able to say, actually, the, the license is going to be respected. Of course, it would depend on the details. Like if he's suing because they didn't include the URL of the license, even though he was attributed, then that's not very nice. But in general, it's good. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so this is a very basic question. In Britain, if you were suing like this, you'd be expected to send, the court would expect you to send a, a letter before legal action to the defendant saying, you know, you are violating blah, 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 and um, you would expect them to come into compliance. Um, it, what's happened in these cases? Is that necessary in US law? Uh, underneath US law, that's not necessary for you to send a cease and desist. It is common practice, um, but the only thing, the only meaningful pleadings in this case, the only, only meaningful documents that were filed in the court that are publicly available were the complaint. Um, I don't recall if in the complaint they indicated that they sent a cease and desist beforehand. Um, generally, most attorneys would put that in there, but I honestly don't remember. Um, and the ones that have settled, there have not been a lot of other paperwork filed. So, you know, the first time I saw the sheer number, I was like, do we have a CC by copyright troll? Um, and then I started looking at them a little bit more, and I'm like, 
It could just be a photographer who's really upset that people keep ripping off his photos, right? And he's like, no, I actually want you to comply. Don't object to sharing like this, but if you're gonna use my photo of Kid Rock, it's Kid Rock and Neil Young, by the way, it's all the photos of Kid Rock and Neil Young. Um, <laughs> if you're gonna write a story about Kid Rock, tell them that it's my photo, it's a really good photo. Yeah, so, so, yeah, somehow I'm, in, I'm invisible, but anyway, um, probably not a big surprise to people who know me, but yeah, I also think it's a good idea. I'm not sure whether it's a good idea to really do it that massively, uh, like with 34 cases in parallel or whatever going on, but I think it's important that um, whatever license there is, if not occasionally there is somebody who enforces it in court, nobody will bother. I mean, that's what we've seen with the GPL historically. Um, and I think it's the same for all of the licenses, whether it's a permissive license or whatnot, uh, people will just not care because if there is no legal risk, why would you invest money and time and resources and so on? I, I just wanna, while we're passing the mic, I just wanna point out one thing, um, just to reemphasize one thing that maybe we didn't emphasize, which was this is a permissive license. And so we, we, when we think of free software, I think there are very few people who believe that there is a risk of screwing up compliance with a, with a <laughs> permissive license. And this demonstrates that there, is signif there can be significant risk. Where did the mic end? Uh, so just commenting on the point there, um, I think a license mainly sued by, by one actor has, is, is risky. Um, from all what I know from this, this concrete example, from this example there, it sounds like a good thing to do. It's better, it's better than ha not having s that, but it would be, of course, even better if multiple uh, parties would like a act like this on principles like we, the community agrees on. Okay. Other opinions? We have one back here. We have the gentleman in the blue sweatshirt in the back there. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicolas Petiot from Belgium. I see. I think that it would be a very good idea to have uh, publicly uh, some kind of uh, trial enforcing the, the license just because uh, information from Wikipedia and especially pictures are often taken by uh, papers, newspaper, and they don't, they don't uh, follow the copyright uh, as they should. And I just want to let you know about a case that occurred in Belgium. So um, you probably remember that the, the, the poster of the Twilight movie was uh, the eclipse and it has been taken by a Belgian photographer who puts all the pictures on Wikipedia. And the picture was one of his and taken from Wikipedia Common. And he went discussing with the producer of the Twilight movie, and unfortunately, the case has been resolved out of court, but he got a lot of money. <laughs> and the yeah, picture was yeah. CC by SA. So, and, and in, in the, yes, but the, the, the problem was that he got, the, he, he got uh, some success and he got the money, but there was uh, some uh, document he had to sign not to disclose the case, so yeah. I'm disclosing it here because he does he cannot do it himself. That's that's excellent. That's fascinating. Uh, one thing I forgot at the introduction: um, we do need to report out on this session. Th at the end of the day, there's a report out, and I'm. Is there someone who could take notes on the the discussion? I know we realize we're starting a little late, but can I have a volunteer to take notes? Thank you. Um, and so, at, to that point, we're at the end of this discussion, and so, so by a show of hands. How many people are in favor of Mr. Pilpot and his enforcement routine? Well, assuming I, he's not a troll. Yeah, assuming he's not a troll. I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite unanimous, but I would say 80% of the room would. Oh, wait, someone whose hand was down is now shaking. <laughs> is that, so are we unanimous? <laughs> Ah, change, change the vote when he went there. So, so uh, we'll say close to unanimous that, that Mr. Philpot is doing a good thing by enforcing his license. Is he is a troll? Just, no. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, one, well no that's, come out pro -troll. no, that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. That's very fast. I think that's a fascinating answer in itself. Okay. Okay. Um, so speaking of CC by SA, um, Draglas versus Kappa. Um, this is from a few years ago, so I was actually surprised that I came across this because it was like three years ago. You would have thought like at some point somebody would have given this as an example. Um, 
So there was a photographer. Um, I don't exactly remember what the photo was. I think it was like of a nature scene in like a roadside in Pennsylvania or something like that. Um, he took a photo. He licensed it underneath CC by SA. Don't remember what, I uh, guess 2.0. Um, photo was used on the cover of a published atlas. Um, the photographer, P, by the way, stands for plaintiff, not photographer. Uh, the plaintiff alleged that the CC by license meant that the, last, the whole atlas had to be offered for free. Um, that's actually from the pleadings, right, but had to be offered underneath CC by SA. The court ruling on this was um, the atlas was not a derivative work of the photo. Uh, the cover was not a derivative work of the original photo either because there was not enough alteration on it. Um, so the point of this case would be what's the scope of copyleft and derivative works? <laughs> My heart stopped. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> All right, if people who want to, who people who are interested in this topic, what is the reach? Of, what is the reach of the copy left? I hope I'm not a jack. I also have to go soon. Uh, well, this is a clearly stupid claim because it's on the uh, photographer's part. Yes, because okay. it's the, uh, the the clear example of what we don't want. The, the CC by uh, SA to mean, and it's also one reason why Wikipedia no longer uses GFDL images, because with GFDL it's not so clear that you can put a GFDL image on a non, with a non-GFDL text. Can you explain what GFDL is? Mean-free documentation. Oh, thank you. It's the original license that Wikipedia okay. used in 2001 until 2009. So oh. it's, uh, wi wi with the cover, it's uh, it's clear. It, it's uh, assuming he was attributed and everything. It, it it should be fine. It would be a different thing if it were like a catalog of photos. Then you could claim maybe. Okay. Other other thoughts on this. So I, I'll, I'll also kind of propose the question is. Uh, so one of the things that we're we, we're. I'm sorry, one of the things we want to demonstrate here is there's litigation going on, and here's litigation on the scope of copyleft. And should, should we be doing anything to be involved in these kinds of questions? I feel the atlas is not a derivative work of the photo myself, so I'm not interested in point one. Point two really surprised, ruling two really surprises me, because I mentally have CC by SA mapped to GPL equivalent. Uh, under which simple reproduction is clearly covered as well as derivative reproduction. If, if what the court is saying is that CC by SA doesn't protect simple copying, I'm slightly stunned in, in CC by SA. So if I remember the court's ruling on this correctly was the photo remains underneath CC by SA. So if you wanted to like buy a copy of the atlas, cut up the cover, take that photo out, you could continue using that underneath CC by SA. But there wasn't a sufficient amount of alteration of the photo to incorporate it into the entire cover. The, when they incorporated the photo into the cover, there was some cropping to make it fit into the right size, but that didn't make the cover a single work. The photo remained an independent work that was surrounded by the cover. Thanks, that makes a lot more sense to me. <laughs> slide which kind of raised one of the points. Yeah, uh, so um, there's two other things that I thought were interesting about this case. Oh, Karen, go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to answer your question of should we be doing something um, yeah, and, do. and just give my thoughts. I think we absolutely should be filing amicus briefs um, and, and thinking about the drawing connections between these implications um, really just to inform the court so that they understand the scope of the decision that they're making, um, you know, and it's just a resource issue. And, and you should and you should champion that and volunteer your time and help us do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's that's a that's a really interesting point, Karen. And the other thing that I thought was interesting about this case was um, the judge in that case said the interpretation of the Creative Commons license, not this particular one, but um, all of them apparently, is an issue of first impression in this circuit. So for those of you who are not familiar with how American courts are organized, I assume that's only one or two of you, right? Um, <laughs> In the United States, the federal court system um, is divided into 15 circuits, I think so, which cover different regions of the country. They all have different jurisdiction. 
13, okay. Uh, I can't never remember this. Um, and um, typically when you go to court, you sue on a contract, they don't say things like first impression. It's the first time they've seen that contract, but they don't expect to see it again. When they use words like first impression, they're usually talking about this is an issue of first impression for interpreting this statute or this regulation or this issue. Right? So the fact that they looked at a Creative Commons license and said this is an issue of first impression for this circuit suggests that the court was viewing this as something that would come to before the court again and that their interpretation now would be guided by other courts had it already come before the court. I just wanted to say that this specific finding was actually very useful and in Wikimedia you, we, we use it a lot because people ask should I really link the few full URL mm. in, uh, in the caption of every image even on new printed newspaper and, and our answer now is no, it's proven. You can just use the acronym and it will be fine. So he's talking about the second quote, which talked about they also sued for the lack of attribution for the licensing terms. And the judge decided that on the back cover of the book, merely putting the letter CC by SA 2.0 was good enough because the license requires a, uh, I can never remember these acronyms correctly. The URI and the letter CC by SA 2.0, if you Google that, that's sufficiently unique to bring you to the license. So it is essentially a URI. So, so I think the significance here, if you if you if you haven't uh, heard, if you didn't, if you didn't, the, so the photograph was on the front of the book, but the attribution was on the back of the book, and the court said that was close enough. And this again plays into attribution notices and what are you know what are attribution requirements or when are they sufficiently met? So yet another question that's relevant to free software. Uh, so you said the attribution was on the back, but did it state that the attribution was for the picture on the front of the book? Because otherwise, I mean, there's some attribution somewhere, yeah. in the, and you have no clue what it is about. It, that was not discussed in the text of the case. I, 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 don't mean, I think it's probably true, because that's typically how you do it in a publication, is you say photograph, cover photograph, by blah. So I, I'm sort of assuming, yes, it meant that it was clear it was the cover photograph. Other comments? Do we want to, do we, any votes to be taken on this? Good, Did bad. We, we have good case, bad case. Should is this harmful to is it this harmful to free software? Is it neutral to free software? How, how let's take uh, let's take a poll. How many think that this case this case's outcome is helpful to free software? A smattering of hands. How many think it's harmful to free software? Zero hands. How many think so? The rest are agnostic. I, do we agree with it? Not to have yeah. impact. Not to have, and, and your reason, and yeah, if we can, if I can just put Karen on mic, um, and I'm not, can, yeah. you, can you explain why you believe it's not going to have impact on free software? I mean, software? it's just that, that these ana the, the analysis is going to be highly fact dependent, and uh, and consequently, because the implication for free software it could is so tenuous in this way, you can make the analogy, but you could also make so many other analogies that yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that right. this case will have much impact. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that kind of plays into this, and we actually don't have more discussion time on this, uh, we're running out of discussion time because we're going to cover these three slides, I think, at the same time. Um, but but there, um, this, and I'm going to talk about this case again in a moment, but one of, the, this, th one of the things that I find really fascinating is what is a work, a quote unquote, what is a work? And that is very, very un unclear and unsettled under U.S. law. So in Blizzard Entertainment, which, which was a case about gaming software, um, there was the argument made that all of the contributors each had a work and were the author of individual works that were all put together as a collective work. And the court said, no, that's not true at all. The copyright uh, individual, it, it was the versions, the versions of, the, of the works with all of the author's contributions combined that were the, the copyrighted work that we did the, the copyright analysis on. on. Fast forward to, or, or look at um, one of the aspects of Oracle versus the Google, the Oracle versus Google case. In a very early opinion on it, the court was asked about what is a work, and in Oracle versus Google, the court said the work is a quote unquote file. Now, if you know the if you know the case, later decisions in the case don't even use the word, don't even talk about files. What it, what is a file? Because the question because it talks about um, methods, classes 
packages and libraries. That's the hierarchy that's discussed. It turns out, and correct, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, and someone in the room who can correct me if I'm wrong, that it is the, that it is the class that is in a, that the class is, a class is in a file. So the modules are in the class, and the class is, a, is the file level, if I have that correct. Yes, I'm getting a nod. So, um, so, so they were entertaining the concept. So even though it was the platform itself, the full Java platform was the registered copyright, the court was willing to say, well, really, that's a whole bunch of copyrighted works each, and considered each file to be a copyrighted work. So we really are in the dark about um, what, what is a work, which to me is very fundamental to free software because you know, there's, this, there's a concept that I hear it frequently said, well, you know, I, I provided, say, a, a, a function within a file, well, I'm the author of that, that's a work, and, that, and I'm the author of that. I don't know whether or not that's going to be true under US law. So, so we will move on to the next one, so, uh, which is the same slide, but a different aspect of it. So this, this case um, sent chills up my spine when I read this case. So this is just really fascinating. It's so, such a complicated development history, I can't even, um, I can't even go, go through it. There were basically two forks. Uh, so this is about a game engine for, um, I forget what the name of the game injured was, but it was, um, what's Dota again? I cannot remember. Does anyone something know of the ancients. Something, something of the ancients. Defense of the ancients. Defense of the ancients, thank you. So basically it was, it was kind of a free for all of, so it was, a, it was a game engine, but then there were all of these worlds created. One of the most popular ones was the, um, Say again, Dota. I'm just going to call it Dota because I can't remember the name. <laughs> it's Dota, and and there were two different there were two different forks of it. One fork at one point the author said got tired of it. He said anybody can use it under an open anybody can use it as open source. Didn't specify didn't specify open license. Source. Yeah, just open source. You can open source. Someone picked up that fork. There was another fork that was a completely different origin. That again was passed along. The case talks about multiple multiple people who contributed on on very high levels, um, including making decisions, uh, making sort of strategic direct decisions about the software. Characters were created. Um, at the end of the day, the court said there, that e despite the fact that there were the, all of these many, many, many contributors. Dozens the, of people. Yeah, at least dozens. It, I think dozens might be an, under, might be an, an, uh, an underestimate. They said um, that there were only three copyright owners and that the two, the two gaming companies, what happened was the two gaming companies, one got an assignment from one of the three and the other got an assignment from the other two, then they duked it out, then they joined forces and went out to sue everybody else for infringement of the game. So to, I read this case and I was like, this looks like a disorganized free software project to me, and at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, the court said three authors, despite very significant um, level of contributions by many other people. The, also the case I love to read because they use all of their nicknames throughout the case. They, they just, which is so it's really fun. So you'll see the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's really, it's really fun. So, so I was, that's why I had palpitations when I saw this case because this was fundamentally problematic to me. So uh, sorry to talk a little long on that, but discussion, thoughts on this, thoughts on this case. Remy? So wearing a hat from a previous life, I was a game design and development professor, right? So we have students developing open source games and they come up with stuff like this and this is a really strange to me because often the students even nowadays know that the engine is separate from the content and you license the engine under an open source or free software license, you license the content under a different license. So the levels, the sounds, the art, the graphics, like all of that stuff is a different kind of material than the engine itself and it's weird to me to think like the character IP as opposed to the game IP can be assigned to the developers because there obviously was more than three people that made all so that So this stuff. had nothing to do with the engine, just to be clear, this had nothing to do with the engine software. Okay. This was all about the gaming environment. So, so it, to the, it was, so what, it was, um, it was basically the gaming engine. The first thing engine. you said was this is about a game engine, so. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, so it started, the reason it happened was because there was a game engine and the, auth and the owners of the game engine decided, wouldn't it be great if we let everybody just develop on it and not put too many controls on it, which is how the situation occurred, that there was so much, um, there was so many um, 
uh, environments in the game, so many maps in the game that kind of were just all over the place and that were so freely shared. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, either way, I'm going to skip ahead and say this is bad because it was super disorganized. I don't think anyone was intentionally doing a lot of this work, and it wasn't clear where the boundaries were, and it kind of landed where it landed, and everyone kind of picked up the pieces, and that doesn't help, right? It's just like for that specific instance, it doesn't give us any guidance that's helpful because no one was following standards and rules. I just want to, I think, make a point of clarification. And this is just revealing that I spent too much of my college days not doing schoolwork. Um, <laughs> Dota started as a, a Warcraft 3 mod, and so yes. the artwork and all that stuff was built within was, was blizzards. And um, I don't know what the facts of this case are and how that affects things, but it was essentially like the copyrights to those characters should have belonged within the game itself. No, I think, if I recall correctly, and I apologize if I'm making this up, I think that they deliberately sort of, if I recall the news at the time, they sort of were like deliberately hands off on ownership in order to encourage development. So they deliberately did not um, acquire ownership in was, works that were developed on the it engine. It was content, it wasn't Blizzard game content, it was the Blizzard game engine. So I think it was the World, World of Warcraft 3 game engine, but it was originally developed content for that game engine that had a community around it. So oh, Blizzard so didn't own the content. And and right. Came from within that engine. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. We're, in yeah. we're letting people do it independently. Yeah. Um, other, other comments on this? I, I, Harold. Yeah, I think uh, the most problematic part is what was outlined last uh, is that there were significant contributions from people who were not recognized as copyright holders. And I think that's, uh, even if it's about the content and not about source code, is uh, rather dangerous when it comes to free software, if you transfer that. and That, that was my, the reason for my palpitations, <laughs> was they, they ignored, uh, certainly if you read the case, the, the level of contributions that were made were what anyone in this room would think would give them copyright. And there were all of these people who were completely shut out. Now, maybe it was expediency on the part of the court. These people were not before the court. They were not part of the case. They, in many cases, they didn't know the real name of the person. They only knew them by their nickname. Um, but, but, that's a, but, but to me, when I read their contributions, I was absolutely shocked because no one in this room would doubt that that was, that that was copyrightable content and it was, and it was ignored. As you said, Pam, that sounds like a really disorganized, you know, open source project. Do you think that, by contrast, even a typical open source project, but that has checked in a clear license file and declared a license instead of just saying open source, and has a revision control history like a Git history, is in a better situation to assert that there are multiple contributors that have copyright because you have this nice audit trail? Um, so she was going to say she was going to say no. I disagree with her. I do well, I think the case. I'll tell you why. I think it would make a difference. I think it in this case it w it could make a difference, but in this case, as I recall, um, the problem was is that two sets of lead developers sold their rights to two different companies. So the people who were in the litigation were trying to monetize and proprietize this, right? So even if all of that copyright management information you could find in the Git history would have been helpful for the people not involved in litigation, I don't think anyone involved in this litigation had any interest in bringing that up. That's, so that's a valid point, and I think that's a valid challenge to the decision on the case. The decision on the case was very clearly outlining significant contributions and saying, but that doesn't matter. Because, it, and there is, there is case law that says it doesn't matter if your contribution would be copyrightable standing alone. In this particular context, you don't have a, an ownership share because of the, um, because of the um, collaborative nature of the development. We are going to, so this is the mastermind theory that I'm sort of freaked out about. Um, th that because that because it is a, a situation where there's a mastermind, it is the mastermind who gets that copyright ownership, and they ignore the, the fact that the rest of the contributions made them made themselves have been copyrightable. Yeah, it's a winner take all. So, yeah. I mean, the point about 
these other contributors whose rights were basically thrown away by the court here, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're not in front of the court and you're not represented, um, I, this is not a very, you know, this is, this is a very surprising conclusion, but in that context it seems much less surprising, and the lesson that we should draw is um, we need people to be represented. Why, why were these other contributors, you know, wh where were their lawyers? Why weren't they in this case saying, oh, we need a share too? That, um, of course, you know, Blizzard and Lilith both wanted, both wanted those people out of the picture. Yeah, absolutely, so yeah. Yeah, very, very valid point. I think then that's, that's, thank you for bringing that around sort of the, to the topic of the day is, you know, maybe we should be involved. I, I suspect that many of these developers um, were not aware there was a lawsuit. Or I, I would love to find them and say, well, what do you think about the fact that Blizzard and... But, but yeah, uh, so that's, I think that's, so we've, we've reached the end of the time. We've gone a little bit over. So let's see, what's our takeaway on this is... Uh, how about if I'm going to go with who's alarmed? Okay, we got a pretty decent turnout of alarmed. Any other questions we should ask? Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, yeah it's just to um, to say uh, in Belgium, if you are not, uh, I know it's in the US, but I'm not sure if it's apply, but if you are not represented in the first instance, uh, you always have a right to oppose uh, the, um, the decision. And the thing is, uh, usually what happens uh, in the first instance when you get uh, a decision uh, when you are not represent one of the parties not represented. Uh, therefore, usually the other party get all, but this decision is very weak because because uh, it, okay. it was not there. So I, I don't know if it's apply in U.S. jurisdiction, but I could say that in Belgium it's very weak decision if one party is not there because it violates the uh, equitable process uh, okay. uh, trial. It, it would be similar in the U.S., but I would also say the train has left the station and you're running to catch up. So. Mm. Who, who, let me ask, so who's a lot, who, who believes that, that perhaps this is something that we should be looking out for and participating in decisions of this or, or cases of this kind? Okay, we got a, uh, about half of the audience maybe on that one. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is probably a less controversial case. And I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't know. I, Maybe we shouldn't alarm anyone in this room unless they have strong feelings about a particular issue. But Artifacts Software versus Hanacom. Artifacts uh, it makes a GNU Go script, um, or maybe Go script. I don't know if they know that they, they do the GNU part of that. Maybe that's something Free Software Foundation does independently. Anyone in the room now? Um, they sued a Korean company for including GoScript inside of, I think it was their word processor. Um, and in the course of that litigation, um, well, actually even the pleadings of that litigation, the, the argument from Artifacts basically was, um, we never gave you a commercial license, which they do allow commercial licenses. Um, you use GoScript inside of your product. Um, therefore, you must have done it underneath the GPL. Um, so we're either suing you for, or we're suing you for both copyright infringement and for um, copyright infringement or and for a breach of contract. Uh, the defendant in this case, Hanacom, came back and said, um, you can't possibly be suing us for contract because we never signed anything. Um, and I really like this quote, actually. So defendant contends the plaintiff's reliance on the unsigned GNU GPL fails to plausibly demonstrate mutual assent, which is a key part of forming contract underneath the US law. That, it's, that is the existence of a contract. Not so. <laughs> uh, really straight to the point there. Um, plaintiff had adequately pled the claim, and the defendant had not proved at this stage the claim is preempted by the Copyright Act, um, which basically underneath US law, that means that there is a state law claim for breach of contract underneath the GNU GPL. I will also say this is not the first court to come to that conclusion, that in the US, um, courts so far think that the GNU GPL is a contract. It doesn't matter if you sign it or not. And you can at least sue for it without even suggesting the other person saw it. Um, so for those of you who have opinions about GNU, uh, contracting, US contracting law, anyone have any opinions? Does anyone need me to explain the implications of that more for you, those of you who are non-lawyers? OK. Um, so uh, generally, the, a lot of people who work in this field as attorneys operate under the assumption that free and open source software licenses are copyright licenses. Um, that is the theory behind it, so that if you don't accept the license, you must be infringing copyright. So we're going to sue you for copyright infringement, right? So you can either admit to that, 
Or you can say, okay, I accepted the license and we'll just talk about whether or not I complied with it, right? And, that's, and you get statutory damages, which means that there's the potential for a fix the dollar amount that you can get for that. It doesn't matter what harms are. You can also sue for contracts, which would be agreement between two parties, right? And there are different remedies available for breach of contract. For example, you could get, you know, you promised to pay me money. You didn't pay me the money. I want that money back. Or you promised to do this thing, and you didn't do that thing. You have to pay me the amount of money it would cost me to do that in your place. Or um, one theory that I particularly like that I think a lot of lawyers overlook is um, you did something in violation of our contract um, that you, and, you were, and you made a lot of money over it. That was unjust. You enriched yourself from doing that unjust thing. Give me all of that money. Um, so there's different remedies that are available here, and there are different ways of suing on it. And it also opens up different courts for you as well, right? You don't always have to go to a federal court on copyright. You could sue in a small claims court, in a state court, where you don't need an attorney, and just sue like, hey, just give me five grand, and company, you're not allowed to bring an attorney, um, things like that. This might be a little too dense for non-lawyers to care. Any lawyers care about this? Any, anyone object to the, anyone vehemently disagree with the concept that, uh, that, that the copyright, that these free software licenses are, are contracts also? <laughs> Not that I disagree well, necessarily, but doesn't the FSF disagree, or do I have that backwards? Well, I, that's why I think it's kind of funny that nobody disagrees because that's the elephant in the room. Is the FSF has always taken that position. As a result of this case, they they published a blog post which I haven't uh, I didn't read recently, but where they kind of accepted accepted the holding of this case and sort of said, well, you know, maybe there are other ways to look at it too. So I, I really want uh, the GPL to be a contract in English law uh, because of the Contracts Rights of Third Parties <laughs> Act. And um, I would like to argue that the GPL grants is intended to provide rights to the recipients of software. And under the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act, those rights are directly enforceable by the people who are supposed to benefit, i.e. the users. Um, but, you know, I don't have the 100 grand it would take to litigate that, so. <laughs> <laughs> we have someone back here. So, so uh, when, when you first presented the slide, you said that under normal kind of contract law, you would, you would normally need to have the mutual assent. Mm -hmm. And the court said, actually, you, not so. I, I didn't get it. Why, oh. why, why is that not the case, or did I misunderstand? Um, so this is actually a challenge for American attorneys because the question of when a contract is formed, um, attorneys gloss over a lot in the United States. Um, so American law, it's very similar to English law too, requires mutual assent. It's an objective manifestation of mutual assent to form a contract, which means you have to take some action that signifies to other people you agreed to the contract. The most typical one would be signing the contract. Right? Um, so a lot of people have assumed if we don't sign the contract, um, Karen looks like she might disagree with me, um, if you don't sign the contract, you don't have a contract. So I would argue that the most common form of assenting is clicking. Right. Is what? No, oh, clicking. Just a click oh, clicking, through yes. rather than. So clicking would also be a common one, yes. All right. Um, the most common form uh, example of assent in law school would be signing. Probably in the real world would be clicking. Um, but that's some objective, you know, someone can see you click, right? But there's actually lots of ways to form a contract. Um, for example, um, there are, depending upon the facts, if you were to send me a contract and I said, oh yeah, this looks all good, I'll read it later and then sign and return a copy unless I have some objection to it. And then I never do that, but I proceed to act as if we have the contract. And I start doing the work the contract required me to do. And I start sending you invoices at the rates underneath the contract. I, if a, my client came to me and they said, this is the situation, but I'm pretty sure there's no contract because I never signed it, I'd be like, yeah, let's just assume that there is um, and prepare for that possibility that there is because you've made a lot of objective manifestations of assent to this contract. So it's not a slam dunk that there's a contract in place, but don't think that you can just say there's none because there's no signature there. So if you download source code, knowing that you have no right to it without a copyright license, and you start using it in software development, 
and you're managing it through Git repos, right? Um, maybe the fact that you're an educated developer who knows that you need a license to use these contracts and that you commonly find those in the root directory or listed in a readme file, the fact that you used it was enough. Yeah, the, I think the, the, the key word is unsigned. That's what, they were, that's what they were keying on, was they said there's no signature on it, therefore it doesn't count. And that's sort of uh, not so, <laughs> to, to quote the court. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we're in agreement. This is a, this is a good holding, a good non-harmful holding, probably a beneficial holding. Um, so, so I have a PS on this. This is my thought on the artifacts cases. Was at one point I went and looked to see. Uh, somehow I don't know what it, what caused me to look, but I went to look and see how many how many lawsuits artifacts has filed, and they have filed. I think there's four. So counting the Hanscom case, there are three more cases, all on um, GhostScript. And uh, these are, I, I don't re recall if they're all open or not, uh, if they're all still open cases. But nevertheless, GhostScript has sued four times on the GPL license, and I have not heard a peep. I've not heard any outrage. I've not heard anyone getting grief about um, artifacts going out there and doing free software license enforcement, which is exactly what they're doing. So I open up, like, why, are, why what is going on? Why are we not talking about this? First one's 2009. It's four times in a decade, really often. Well, the la and the <laughs> well, no, Hans yeah, when was Hanscom? Well, Hanscom was, dis it was filed, we don't have the, 16. There were three, no, three within a year. Three within a year, Six, yeah, three within a year. 2009, and then a gap, and then three more. Sorry to get caught up on the frequency, but if you consider how often GhostScript is used by how many companies in how many products used by how many people, I think this is not frequent. This is not what? It's frequent, not frequent. Not frequent. Yeah, I mean, okay. Sure, compared to how many other litigations there are ongoing, it maybe is, but uh, I mean, I, I heard about some of those cases, and yeah, I'm not, I mean. Uh, so let me ask you, how, ma how many have you filed, and how many are you still getting grief about? <laughs> like, it's, it's not so much that I, it's, I'm not actually commenting on the frequency, I'm commenting on where's the outrage? Well, I don't when think. You do it, when you do it once, I think there's outrage, yes? No. No, okay. No. What yeah, conservancy yeah, yeah. does it want? <laughs> yeah, you see, I, I'm invisible, you know, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> here we have... <laughs> we got <this> right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I also, I'm not sure, I mean, the, the examples you have are all against new PDF, which looks more like a personal like be acting it, it on was a, a use in apps in the app store so the first one was used in the palm pilot and then the, the last three the, the last two listed in the slide they had embedded in an app being distributed through i think the android app store yes but but the containing program was always mu pdf the the the, in, the program they infringed on was mu pdf yes i'm so am i i Which once the GPL, i once yeah. looked at this project and i really was not too sure about their open. So they look kind of open sourceish, but somehow really weren't. Maybe it's, it's, what I was saying. Maybe it was more like fighting directly mu PDF against the artifacts for reasons. Well, not not so much like generally defending GPL. I, I think that's part of my point too. Is is we have someone who has a dual licensing model here who is out enforcing the GPL, and again, no, you know, nobody seems to be talking about it. So I, I have an answer to why nobody is talking about this, right? You look at these defendants. None of these defendants is VMware. Now, these defendants are probably not members of the Linux Foundation. Mm. Um, okay. The Linux Foundation, um, their management, their corporate membership is not very favorable to GPL enforcement. Um, that's probably part of why VMware are there even, to make common calls with those other people. Um, they're not enforcing on Linux. So what's, what's controversial is, is not enforcing the GPL. This, these are straightforward GPL violations. Why would that be controversial to sue on that? No, it's, it's controversial when you sue about Linux because mm. Linux is a, a political thing of its very own. Okay, we actually have to move on. We've, we've run over our time on this one. Uh, take away, any takeaways on this? 
It's not fair. Ruby, <laughs> 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 you're still counting notes. Did you your, get that quote? Your reminder just came up. It's not fair. Your reminder came up. Yeah. All right, next one. Next case. We have uh, you. Oh, simple word. Oh, and I, when, I, when I was referring to one lawsuit, that was BusyBox, actually, that I was referring to. So just to address the point about uh, uh, Linux um, and the controversial the aspect of it, and that the VMware lawsuit was filed by Christoph and not by Conservancy, funded by Conservancy. That is true. Thank you for the clarification, Karen. Um, so Zimpleware versus Versata Software et al. Um, so there was a lot of lawsuits for this one, for those of you who like digging through the dockets of American court cases. Um, so um, the, the story on this one was there was a company in Texas that produced some financial an analyst software for insurance companies. Um, the insurance company did something they didn't like. They decided to sue their client. Their client wasn't happy about that. They started digging through the source code. It was like, oh, look, some of the software you gave us was licensed underneath the GPL. They called up Zimpleware. Um, said, hey, um, did you know that our, the person suing us violated your GPL license? They're like, no, we did not. Thank you for telling us. Um, Zimpleware turned around and sued the company, Versada. Um, also sued the report, person that reported the violation to them, Ameriprise. <laughs> Um, so that first lawsuit was where Zimpleware, or, so the first lawsuit Zimpleware filed was they sued the infringer, a bunch of their customers in a copyright suit, um, which I think got a fair amount of discussion in the United States amongst attorneys who track this kind of stuff. They also filed a companion case um, against the customers, um, and I think also against the original infringer in Versada, um, in a patent case. And that case settled. Um, but if you actually go and read the pleadings in that case on a motion to dismiss, um, the court kind of assumed that there was, actually said explicitly there was a patent grant in GPLv2. Because an express patent license is a defense to patent infringement, Zimpleware's direct patent cl infringement claims turn on whether or not the customer distributed in violation of the GPL, right? So the court agreed with the defendants in that case that you have a patent grant underneath GPLv2 unless you violated the terms of the GPL. So the only way they could have violated in these, in these particular facts is if they had distributed it unlawfully uh, or in violation of the GPL. And then they went on to talk about what distribution would actually meant. Um, I think this is probably non-controversial. I definitely missed this the first time I read it, but the court concluded that um, the only way distribution would have happened is if they had given it to their contractors who worked outside the company and distribution couldn't be predicated on distributed internally. So internal distribution, according to this court, is not a violation of the GPL. Um, and there's definitely an express patent grant inside of GPL v2. Thoughts? Good? Bad? Hands? We're ready for a vote. We're good. We can catch up on our slides. All right. So let's, so, so actually, I will, I will, let me, um, let me pose a question maybe a little bit first for a second here. Um, so this was this all happened is this all happened an insurance company is litigating the GPL that is not their business they're in the insurance business do we have faith and trust in what these other companies are going to be doing when they are litigating these free software issues how many people trust their insurance company <laughs> <laughs> One. is that I wanted the microphone or is that I trust my insurance company <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts? Discussion? Okay. All right. Oh, Karen? wait, Karen. I think it's a disaster, and I think it says it all. Like, personally, I think that's exactly the point, is that we have, that the GPL is going to get thrown around as a collateral issue in cases where parties, none of the parties care about free software, care about copyleft, or care about anything that is akin to our values. And they will use whatever they can to get their small business advantage for a more profitable outcome for their business dispute. And I, I think we're going to see this again and again and again if we don't form a litigation strategy as you posit in this session. I think the Dota case being a good example where the people who had an interest weren't, the, the, it was, we had two corporate interests warring it out for their best, their best outcome with, and no consideration of the developers. Yep. Oh, okay. So Oracle versus Google, and I'm sure you all like rolled your eyes. You're like, no, not Oracle versus Google. Um, <laughs> but but there's but I have a point on this. There's there's uh, there's I thought a really interesting uh, two Oracle versus. This is the second one. Most people probably think you're the first one. Oh, 
Well, this is this is the second this is the second decision in Oracle versus uh, Google, which was a fair use case. But the reason that I'm pointing it out is we sort of walk around assuring ourselves that the industry custom is going to save the day. Oh, sure, we maybe don't comply with the license, but everybody does it that way, so it's totally fine and will be fine. And I'm here to say that's not going to be true because what happened, so, so when we break it down, the industry custom, what is the relevance of industry custom? In the US, it has, it has relevance in contract interpretation. So uh, first I look at the terms of the, of the agreement, I look at the words, if it's clear from the words itself, from the body itself, we're done. We don't look at anything else. If I need some extraneous information in order to interpret it, then maybe I can look like there's a confusing definition. I can look at dictionaries to figure out what that means. And, and, and there's sort of this, this pecking order of what you can consider as extraneous information. And sort of at the bottom of the pecking order is, is industry custom. So we all think, oh, well, you know, we're all, we all just do this. Well, first off, it only matters in a contract interpretation case. So if there's no contract in play, it doesn't matter. So for example, in Oracle versus Google, this, um, I, let me stop, change my, change what I was going to say. The other area where it came up, the area where it came up in, um, in Oracle versus Google was Google used the excuse, they said, this is a fair use, and, we, and, and, and one of the reasons it's a fair use is we were only doing what the, what the industry does. We copied APIs. Everybody knows it's okay to copy APIs. That's, that's the industry custom. It, we were totally in the right to do this. We had no idea this might be unlawful. Court could have cared less. Just completely ignored it, said your good intention doesn't matter. That's not a factor in fair use. This was not a fair use. And so we're at a position now where Google is, is, has infringed the Oracle copyright. So let me just give you an example of an industry practice that I think probably will resonate pretty well. How many people here think that if you come across a Git repo with some source code in it, and there's a copy of the GPL license in the root directory, that means the, that, that software package is licensed underneath the GPL? How many people aren't raising their hand because I'm asking the question? I, I'm going, I'll put my hand up that it's okay. I think it's totally okay. Yeah. 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 I would say that probably a lot of attorneys would agree with you. I would say that almost every developer I've ever spoken to would agree with you. And I would say that's an industry custom. I think his point being that a court might find different because it doesn't say expressly, this is the license for this software. It just happens to be a file in the directory. Who knows what that means? So that, that's, that, so, okay, so discussion on this. Industry, I guess this is more, again, sort of in the alarming, in the alarming area. Should we, what should we be doing? What can we be doing? Are you alarmed by this? Yeah, are you alarmed by this? I think I'm alarmed um, and uh, mostly in terms of the industry custom because it's also been used as an excuse uh, sort of regarding let's say the GPL v2 requirements on that each individual change must be annotated with a timestamp and you know uh, all these uh, things that in practice uh, are not really practiced if you look at you know 95 or 99 percent of the source code that companies release this is not there and um, yeah, what other sort of recourse do you have for not following that obscure part of the license that's not really in practice if you cannot claim that this is, uh, you know, yeah. come an industry? Uh, uh. Um, what worries me that only industry customs and not community customs are mentioned here. <laughs> Right, good, good point. I, I think I, I do think they would go so far as to say the community is the industry, but that's actually a, a really good point. Is again because we're sort of on the fringe, we're so much on the fringe that first we have to explain to them what a community is and how that differs from an industry. Very good point. There is a fact pattern that that is a little unique in this case, and that uh, it hinges on the structure, sequence, and organization of Java, which um, I'm told by uh, lawyer that I highly respect is pretty directly taken from the copyright statute that we could say that that's copyrightable. I think what's really interesting in this case is above the fact pattern of this case are APIs copyrightable generally per custom. Uh, I just want to highlight for people that might not have seen it there is I b believe an amicus brief on the EFF where a number of computer science professors and other people have weighed in on this custom of APIs not being copyrightable. And so 
I think that this is going to be a very significant decision um, about industry practice because I think that the custom has influenced behavior. However, if we have a clear court decision that APIs are in fact copyrightable, and I heard this in an earlier talk today, then there's this whole issue of what's a derivative work of an API, and that will be really problematic. I'll just point out that the brief that you're talking about was one that was before the Federal Circuit, and the federal, this is the Federal Circuit that said, we don't care. So I want to briefly make two points. One is I want to distinguish this uh, point about industry practice from the license file and the root directory situation, because um, the, in, in the Google, Google versus Oracle, um, what's question, the question is, does something being an industry practice mean that it's fair use? Um, whereas, in the license file and the root directory question, uh, well, that's a question of giving a license is a question of communication. It's a question of giving permission, and custom and practice is how communication happens. So I think it's possible to distinguish that. Well, I, I mean, I think we can, the, 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 as a group, we can think of a whole bunch of situations. It's one of the reasons I work in this field, as I, or I was first intrigued by this field, was the complete disconnect between what the community thinks licenses say and what they actually say, what a court, how a court would interpret them. And so I think we could, we, all of us could come up with, with examples of where there's a big disconnect. And um, I might say linking is one example where I think a court might come out quite differently from what the sort of communal understanding of the relevance of, of linking and copyleft. Right. Certainly. I, I'm not sure I disagree with what you just said either. It's, I think my point is that it's complicated and there's lots of ways to look at it. And this is one of the things that are involved. Okay. I had a, a second point, if I may. Um, I'm not sure that this law, I mean, I'm not an expert in the European law in this area, but I don't think that, I think this is probably not good law in Europe, because Europe has a special exception to copyright for um, things you need to do to make things compatible, and that makes API copyrights much weaker if it, you know, if they survive at all. Um, I'd, I'd be curious, I, I don't want to sidetrack this conversation because that's kind of out, a little outside of the scope of what we're going to talk about. This fair use decision was premised on the concept of interoperability where the trial court and the, and the appeals court had very different views on, because yes, and that's a kind of another thing is interoperable. Oh, interoperability is a fair use, which is a gloss that kind of covered what was really the real details of what of what interoperability means and I suspect that would be the same too is is you know what is interoperability compatibility or whatever the exception is um, you know how far does how far does that go I have no doubt you're right about that because fair use in the United States is premised on the First Amendment so like it'd be weird if it was an exact knowledge in the EU um, the point for this though not is that so much that fair use matters is that I think for us at least we look at industry custom and go our clients and often other attorneys rely on this far too often, and that actually there's very limited circumstances where fair, or for industry custom comes into practice. Um, for instance, if you read some of the free and open source software licenses that are approved by OSI, some of them have integration clauses, which means that you're not allowed to look beyond the scope of the, the text of the license. Underneath US law, you would not, in a contract interpretation case, which is how licenses would be interpreted, look to industry custom because of that industry uh, integration clause. Which I think brings it back to Harold's point, which was a court is going to look at that. You know, someone's going to say, oh, well, they're out of compliance with the license because they didn't mark their changes. A court would be, yeah, he's right. <laughs> license breach, you're done. So, uh, yeah, that's. Your Git repository is your source code. <laughs> <laughs> I have my microphone, so. ah, yeah, I do. Well, the point is, <laughs> how, how many source code releases that you have ever received from companies using GPL licensed software did include any form of commit log or Git repository or anything? For me, it's zero, literally zero. I've never received any kind of change log or revision hi history. So the point of whether or not that's somewhere in Git is moot because it was not part of the source code that was distributed or released. But well, that's not the preferred form for modification, then, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, not everybody shares your preference. <laughs> so, so if we can, we're at, we're at the end of the time for this case. Um, question for the crowd: Has this changed? Has this changed your view on sort of how safe we are that the licenses are going to be interpreted in the ways we hope? One, only one person. Two. All right. 
Maybe the question was confusing. Yeah, sorry, the, the question was, was, was long-winded. So has it changed? Are you now more worried about relying on this like everybody is doing it defense than you were before? Got about half the people who say, yeah, I'm more worried. They're sort of tentatively more worried. There's, no. <laughs> I, only, I only had one that was like, oh, hell yeah, two. I had two. <laughs> but, but when we think about it, OK. Is it weird that our goal is kind of to like upset people? <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad when other people feel good. Um, okay, um, so another case that I think kind of piles on this, um, Great Minds versus FedEx Office and Print Services. Um, so this is actually kind of an interesting case. So um, Great Minds is a producer of educational material in the United States. I believe they sold a copy of a book, an education plan, maybe it was a textbook, to a school in New York State. Um, that school told an intern or a teacher or something like that, someone who wasn't paid very much, right? Could have been an intern, could have been a teacher, um, to go to FedEx and make copies of that lesson plan. Um, and Great Minds said, well, we gave you that book underneath the CC by, uh, CC by SANC. Uh, FedEx in the United States, if you don't know, it's kind of like a copy shop. You can go and we get photocopies or print things off. They're a commercial entity. Their commercial activity is making copies. Uh, FedEx, you made a copy in the course of your commercial business of a non-commercially licensed work. We're going to sue you. Mm, okay, not the point of my story here. <laughs> um, so um, in the course of this case, Creative Commons was just like, hey, we know what that license means. Does anyone here think that Creative Commons knows what the Creative Commons by SANC license means? One person, what? everyone else, everyone else is scared to answer my questions. Um, I'm positive they know what that means. There's a lot of really smart people who are involved in writing that license. It's a really well written license. Um, so they said, we'll do something, right? We think that we're going to afford a unique, if not definitive, perspective on the meaning of this license. <laughs> Someone knows where I am going, right? So this long quote comes from the amicus brief that Creative Commons filed, and this is the response they got from the court. The entire thing. So I will read it for those who might be, have vision issues. It is hereby ordered that Creative Commons Corporation's motion for leave to file an amicus curiae brief is denied. Which means, if you don't know what amicus curiae brief means, is we don't care what you think, leave us alone. Right? So, and for those of you who are going to look at that and go like, oh, well, this is a district court case. No, this was at the federal, this was at the second circuit in the United States. So it was a circuit court case. We had a lunchtime conversation where an attorney said, I don't care about district courts. I only care about circuit courts. Um, so we have a circuit court in the United States, one of the more prominent circuit courts in the United States, who says, I don't care what the licensed steward or the licensed author thinks this, this license means. I know how to read for myself. Anyone have any thoughts about that? <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but that seems really surprising because I thought the whole point of uh, Amicus briefs was to inform the court about circumstances of, of the case, of a case. Um, yeah, so in the United States, the purpose of an amicus brief is to inform the court about it, but you have to request permission. So it's kind of by the pleasure of the court um, if they want to listen to you. I mean, it's, it's basically unsolicited advice, right? So if anyone's gotten into a fight with their partner um, and your best friend shows up and says, you know what you did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a little bit what's going on, right? So if it's your best friend, you might go like, please tell me I'm at a loss, right? That might happen. They might also go, get the F out of my house. Um, or get out of my house in a really mean way for those who don't know what F stands for in, in American English. Um, so they don't actually have to listen to you. But that is the point. But they have the option not to. Um, and the courts presume that these licenses are interpreted the same way contracts are. So that they have every, they have every much capacity as any other attorney in the world to read the license, because they know how to read contracts. So they can just say, we don't need your help. We actually know how to read contracts. Your opinion doesn't matter. You're not a party to this suit. 
I think actually it goes even even beyond that is is you um, the court is not allowed to consider again this extraneous evidence. So if you need to discern the intent of the parties, you are to your your uh, what you should be doing is in is inferring their intent from reading the document itself. So it's the intent as manifested in that document under U.S. law, and this does vary. Diff this does vary in other countries, but it is the but we just the the document is is king. And if I can figure it out from the document itself, I don't need any other information. And by the way, I'm a smart lawyer and I can read words. I mean, I don't know much about procedural aspects uh, in the U.S., but um, you said you have to ask permission whether or not you, this, uh, this, this uh, brief will be accepted by the court. Wouldn't the best strategy then be first to ask permission without disclosing the content and then file the actual content? <laughs> Um, so I actually think that's what's interesting about it. So the way that you actually do this in the Second Circuit is that you write a motion for your amicus brief to be accepted, and the um, attachment to that motion is the amicus brief. Um, so it's, it's not uncommon for courts to just never rule on that motion, which you would take as meaning maybe they read it, maybe they didn't read it, it's in their stack of paper. Um, the fact that the court went through the trouble of not just ignoring it, which they had the option of doing, but issuing an order saying that, no, you're not allowed to file it, despite the fact that it's in our stacks of paper already, um, signals to me that the court was actually making a point about their involvement in the case. Thoughts? Disturbed? Disturbing? Not disturbing? Head nods? Not disturbing. Not disturbing. Not disturbing. I'd like to hear from the not disturbing group. I'd like to hear why from the not disturbing. I just kind of, I mean, I'd just throw it out there. Uh, it's weirdly kind of probative. I mean, if it was a jury making this mind up and it's a third party kind of weighing in and everyone's going to assume that the, you know, that, that these guys were right, right? It's like, and now to hear from the dictionary author, you make up your own mind, but here's what they think. You know, so it is kind of like oddly probative. It should just be, you know, look, you didn't, you know, draft the license, but you certainly applied it between the two of you. So what did A and B mean? Not what did C think A and B should mean? So it doesn't strike me as particularly you know, wonky that it was denied. So I actually agree with you that that's the right way to look at that. And it kind of, it, it kind of disturbs me that everyone gives the deference to the licensed stewards because I think you're right. That's the right way to look at this yeah. is it's my work. I chose the language I was going to license it under. What matters is how I interpreted that, that language. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It doesn't matter if I hired an attorney to write it for me or I cut and paste it from the Free Software Foundation or from Creative Commons. Um, in fact, that's really common in industry for attorneys in the United States, at least. We cut and paste all the time. Um, <laughs> I know, you didn't know this, but American attorneys are giant plagiarists. Um, and we don't even pay attention to where it's coming from. It certainly never crossed my mind that if I copied a warranty disclaimer clause and pasted it into a contract, that someone would go ask the person who originally wrote that warranty disclaimer clause what my client meant by it. We have one more question. We have time for one more. It's not a question. You just wanted to hear from the, the not worried yes, community. Please. I was a lot more worried, and then you explained how license and contract interpretation is generally treated by the courts over there. If it had been a, a lawsuit about improper bird feeding, they wouldn't have accepted an amicus brief from the Audubon Society by the sound of it. Um, I'm not saying that they wouldn't. It's just that they don't have to, right? That it's not a guarantee that the courts are going to listen to the Free Software Foundation or Creative Commons or the Eclipse Foundation. But as I understood you to say, it's more normal for them not to need any help doing license and contract interpretation. Well, attorneys are arrogant. So <laughs> um, my point is, is that they don't, need, they don't need the help and they don't need to presume that. Um, I would say the higher you go up in courts in the United States, courts tend to say, like, yeah, file it. And then whether or not they read them or not, kind of, it's a little iffy. Um, the thing that upsets me about this is that when we talk about what does the GPL mean, I frequently give advice to clients and saying like, well, according to the Free Software Foundation, the GPL means this. And then they listen to it. For a license that, for software that is not for software that is not owned by the free software. They're right. not the licensor. So, but yeah, we kind of give undue deference to that license steward. Yeah, after all your explanations, I think just the court wanted to show the, the independence because uh, mm -hmm. I, I think they clearly understood that if the uh, license steward came along, um, 
they came with some authority and they wanted to say, yeah, you might, but we're re really on our own and uh, we don't want to be in a light of like being pushed in a direction by the license steward. I feel like we're not upsetting people. Well, well, I wanted to. I think we need to call the question on this one. And so, my question, my question is, um, what was my question? Do do we believe that it's important for a licensed steward to give an opinion on these licenses to aid a court in their interpretation? So the answer, if if the answer is yes, I do think we we should have licensed stewards. Let the courts listen to the licensed stewards to give an interpretation. Oh, that's not the same question. Oh, so what, what was the question? Repeat my question. <laughs> Ask one question, not two. Yeah, sorry. sorry. I, I, thought, I thought you were asking, is it important for licensed stewards to give an opinion? And then you said, is it important for courts to listen to it? All right, let's go with the first Thank one. you. Good, good one, good one. Is it, important, is it important for licensed stewards to give an opinion on a license, to try to give an opinion to the, on the license to the court? And the answer, so we have, we have a, about uh, two-thirds, I would say, of the, of the crowd on that one. So okay. does, it, does it upset anyone to see courts ignoring that opinion? No. Okay. So it's important to give the opinion, but they're not upset to see courts not taking the opinion. Okay. Interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, it's just for, like, peace of mind on how that turned out. Um, the court generally agreed with the interpretation of the Creative Commons Foundation. Um, so it was, it was considered <laughs> non-commercial. Um, yes. But I didn't want to say that because that wasn't the point. That's it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so I don't know how much time we have left, but we got through Three minutes. all of our cases. So are there any last thoughts or general comments, or does anyone have a political opinion that they want to hear to share with a room full of people that they don't know? Your talk had a very provocative title about us coming up with a litigation strategy. So my question to both of you is, how do the people who are here and may see this video uh, follow up with you and help you in crafting the litigation strategy? Moi? <laughs> we, vous. Well, I, th I think that we, we had an interesting conversation at lunch, and I, and, um, I think it, there was, oh, actually, what, can you restate what you stated about sort of if we can't even get consensus on what we should be enforcing? Do you remember what you said about that? I don't remember. I'll, rem I'll, rem I'll remind him of what, he's, what he said. Was he made the point was, um, should we, so, so I think both of us believe that there should be some kind of litigation strategy here because we are alarmed by what we see going on. Um, but but the, the much harder question is, what is that strategy and what is it that we're worried about that we should be stepping in, that we maybe should be acting proactively? And if we can't even come to a, con if we can't come to a consensus on what that is, then that exposes um, a, a, not a problem in our community, but, but grounds for further work just within our community or ourselves before reaching out is we have to figure out what it is we want to accomplish. Well, so. Well, I did. I, did. I was. Ex we were honestly expecting more disagreement, but. <laughs> um, I mean, there's I, there's conflicting talks. So there were a couple of lawyers we had lunch with who um, profoundly disagreed with us, and I'm a little disappointed <laughs> that here. they did not come. Um, but some of the, just to represent their point of view, um, one of them was, who do you think the community is, mm -hmm. right? So um, I'm pretty sure the community is not just this room. Right? So who gets to pick and choose? Who actually speaks for the whole community? Right? So is the Free Software Foundation the appointed head of the community? Is it SFC? Is it Red Hat? Is it Oracle? Right? I'm pretty sure no one in this room thinks it's all four of them because they all exactly agree on how these licenses should be worked. But I think they probably all have a claim to speaking on behalf of the community in some respect, um, at least as significant contributors to the community. Um, and then the, the question that I was really getting at is like, what, what should our role be involved in this, right? Is there things that we want to see happen and should we be taking steps? 15 years ago, I think the community, before I got involved in the legal community, said, we don't want to sue about this because we'll scare companies. And my personal opinion at this point in time is companies can't say no to free software, right? So I talk to lawyers all the time and they've been told by their business customers, um, I have to use free software. Um, can you help me understand this? And the first thing they want to know is, can you show me the court cases and you underneath U.S. law that tells me the things you're saying are true? And it's not because they want to find out if they're going to get sued if they use it. It's because American attorneys trust court cases. Um, so they're not scared about litigation. They know they don't have a choice about using it. 
So maybe we should rethink that decision to sit out on litigation um, because we don't have to worry about scaring people off anymore. Okay. That's just one man's opinion. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to share what I, I'm no. worried about. And no, no more. I, I think we would. All right, all right, we've got to cut you off. Sorry. Yeah. I'll listen to you. Thank you.